Minister. Cancorla, I wish to provide members with an update on the Procurement Board. Procurement expenditure accounts for some £3 billion annually, representing a quarter of the Executive's budget. This makes the Executive a hugely significant buyer of goods, services and construction work, and there is a tremendous potential to use this spending power for good. Procurement policy is overseen by the Procurement Board, which I chair as Finance Minister. As with many areas of work, the restoration of the Procurement Board has been delayed by the pandemic. The procurement team within my department has been focused on the response to COVID, and I would like to thank the team for assisting in the procurement of essential PPE for our public services. In particular, working with the Department of Health and the Executive Office, it secured a £60 million order of PPE from China. In a very competitive global market, this was a remarkable achievement for a small regional government. Today, I can announce the restoration of the Procurement Board, which will meet on the 16th of December. I would also like to update members on how, with the agreement of the Executive, I decided to restructure the Procurement Board. Cancorla, I have completely changed the makeup of the Board. Previously, almost 20 people attended the Procurement Board. This was too large a group, and I have reduced the membership by half. This will allow the group to meet more regularly and to drive forward reform. Previously, the Procurement Board had been staffed by permanent secretaries. As accounting officers, permanent secretaries have a significant interest and role in procurement, but I believe the board should be made up of the experts who actually design and manage procurement exercises. I am therefore replacing the permanent secretaries with four procurement practi practitioners. From the health sector, I am appointing Peter Wilson, Interim Director of Operations, Business Service Organisation, who is responsible for procurement and logistics. To provide expertise in the delivery of infrastructure, I am appointing John Irvine, Director of Major Projects and Procurement within the Department for Infrastructure. Sharon Smith, Department of Finance Commercial Director, will also be appointed as she has extensive experience in procuring a wide range of supplies and services for departments. And from the Strategic Investment Board, which is responsible for the biosocial policy, I am appointing Brett Hannan. The people who design and manage public contracts will therefore be at the core of procurement policy. It is also important that procurement policy benefits from the expertise of the sectors that tender for and deliver public contracts on behalf of the public sector. I have therefore appointed five representatives from key sectors in the economy. From the construction industry, I have appointed Mark Spence, Managing Director of the Construction Employers Federation, and Denise McMahon, Chair of the Northern Ireland Construction Group. To represent the manufacturing sector, I have appointed Mary Meehan, Deputy Chief Executive of Manufacturing NI. And to speak on behalf of small and medium enterprises, I have appointed Ian McClelland, Director of LM Services, a mechanical and electrical engineering company, and a member of the Procurement Board for Forum for Small Businesses. And to champion the interests of social enterprises, I have appointed Colin Jess, Director of Social Enterprise NI. These representatives will be asked to engage with their respective sectors in order to bring their views and experiences to the Procurement Board. I would like to thank the outgoing members for their time and commitment during the term of the previous board. Last Concorda, to date, procurement policy has been approved through the procurement board and circulated through the public sector through guidance notes. Compliance with this guidance has been not entirely consistent. It is therefore important to elevate the status of procurement policy. From now on, procurement guidance notes will go to the executive for approval. Procurement policy will therefore carry the authority of government ministers who are accountable to the public and their accounting officers who are legally responsible for ensuring public expenditure provides value for money. The new members of the board will be asked to identify problems, quickly develop solutions and bring fresh thinking to procurement policy and practice. However, I want to finish my statement by highlighting some of the immediate priorities I would be asking the board to progress. One of those priorities is social value. I am aware this is also something the all-party group on social enterprise chaired by Stuart Dixon is also very passionate about. It is important to point out that social value is not only a concern of social enterprise. There are many private sector businesses that want to contribute to social good, for example by lower, lowering carbon emissions or paying their staff a living wage. But these social benefits are not factored into tenders that only score on price and equality. On quality, sorry. Therefore, I intend to bring a new policy on social value to the first meeting of the Procurement Board. With this policy, social value would be a mandatory component of procurement exercises rather than an optional add-on. Another policy priority is security of supply. The COVID pandemic triggered a global scramble for PPE and other essential supplies. We do not want to be in that position again. It would be much better if we could source vital supplies locally rather than worrying about supply routes by air and sea. The need for secure supply routes is also heightened by breakfast. 
Brexit, sorry, which is uh, likely to disrupt trading uh, relationships, particularly if the British government fails to agree a trade deal with the European Union. A stronger focus on security of supply will, of course, benefit local businesses and help increase employment levels. So I'll be asking the Procurement Board to develop policy in this area. There are many other policies I would like the Board to consider, and I will welcome members' views on what other procurement issues that they would like to be brought to the table. Last concorda, the new structure of the Procurement Board will mean that procurement policy is co-designed by those that manage and those that deliver government contracts. And that will mean procurement policy carries the authority of executive approval. I believe these changes will help, help maximise the social, economic and environmental impact of the executive's three billion annual spend on procurement. I would, member, I would welcome members' views on the new procurement board and the issues it should focus on. Thank you. I call the chair of the committee, Dr. Steve Aiken. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for the minister's remarks so far. And indeed, thank you for meeting me earlier today, minister. To thank you as well. Um, the minister will be aware that the committee wrote to the minister in March about the formation of this board. And despite the delay, we welcome the fact that you've made the statement here today. There is much detail in the formation of the board, and we as committee will wish to take the time to scrutinise it and look at it closely. But we have a few initial questions I'd be like you to sort of answer. Uh, firstly, uh, forming this board under your chairmanship, which will be seeking to control and manage three billion, or approximately, I think it is a quarter of our uh, executive's budget, is this appropriate through new decade, new approach to the other instruments, particularly the fiscal council has been set up? And could you also give us a piece of guidance on when we expect the Fiscal Council to be in position? The other questions are, where are, we where are the terms of reference? And in procurement, could you say, who will have primacy in the procurement process? Is the role entirely to provide policy, or is it to direct cross-executive procurement spending, and where that lies? How does, this inter how does the procurement board interrelate to the services sector, and particularly since a lot of government expenditure seems to go to the likes of PwC and Deloitte and other consultancy services. Will there be a representative of the services sector on the procurement board? There are going to be significant procurement issues, and I noticed you talked in your remarks, Minister, about the importance of making sure that the Northern Ireland supply chain is given primacy. But you will be aware, of course, uh, well, if we ever, ever get any details out of the Joint Committee or the Specialist Committee, that we will be still having to apply EU procurement rules. And in fact, we may not be able to do what you've put out in your statement that we wish to do with procurement. So we need to have some guidance and views on that. And finally, uh, we believe that the role of bringing outside experts into the process is to be welcomed. And I can't think of any member of this assembly who does not welcome the fact that we're actually getting the external expertise to bring to it as well. However, would you give consideration to have an independent chairman of the board? Because with you being chair of the board of a procurement process, looking at significant amounts of government spending, it may seem to be that the best will and guidance and advice coming from the external sectors is not being utilised appropriately to be able to get us the best out of our procurement spend. But we as a committee will be looking forward to getting more details of this and we'll look forward to you coming and talking to us about the procurement board at the earliest convenience. Not only did the chairman of the committee go up to the line with that, with that series of questions, the line is somewhere in the distance. Um, the minister is under no obligation to answer. I think there were six questions. He's under no obligation to answer all of them, but I'm sure he can try. Minister. Well, thank you, uh, pre Las Concorda. I, I, I identified six questions also in, in that, and I, I will attempt to... Uh, to uh, to answer the chair of the committee in relation to the fiscal council, uh, like the procurement board itself, uh, COVID has impacted on the speed with which we wanted to deliver on that new decade, new approach commitment. Uh, but we are in an advanced stage, and I hope we'll be able to bring propositions uh, in relation to that very, very soon to the executive. The terms of reference, of course, uh, are being uh, will be signed off on in the next day or two, and we will ensure the committee are informed in relation to to that. The uh, uh, in terms of the, the role of the, uh, the, the board itself, um, and, and this probably addresses a couple of questions, including the issue of, of chairing it, uh, one of the, I suppose, consistent complaints 
uh, is, has been about a lack of consistency in that procurement policy and procurement guidance uh, have been the property of the procurement board, but they haven't necessarily filtered down through government departments and certainly into arm's length bodies and agencies. Uh, and if we want to ensure consistency uh, and a delivery across that, then the, the, if you like, the authority in relation to it has been given to the executive because they will pass the procurement guidance notes. They will be responsible for authorising those. Uh, and my role then as an executive minister in terms of chairing the board will be to ensure that there is that continuity through to the executive and that executive authority then to flow down through departments, through permanent secretaries and ministers to make sure uh, that there's a follow through. Uh, so there has been good procurement policies and guidance notes, uh, but the reality is they've, they've somewhat slowed as they move down the chain through departments and not necessarily been reflected in output. And we want to make sure uh, that this isn't just some, uh, an organisation or a board that produces policies for the sake of having documents, but one which actually changes the way uh, business is done. The consultancy sector is, is a varied sector, as he knows, uh, and the services sector. Uh, we have looked for sectors which have, if you like, uh, 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 groups which represent the broad sector to, to draw from to get uh, some expertise. Uh, if there are other sectors which are identified as clearly a gap in that, I'm happy to look at that again to see if, if uh, uh, you know, that sector can come together and if there's an organisation which might represent it uh, and someone available from that. Uh, and in relation to supplies, uh, I mean, we did repurpose uh, and, uh, and as a response to the pandemic, we, we did have local businesses, local manufacturers in particular, that repurposed their, their, their output that came, that actually stepped up. And I could think of people like O'Neill's in terms of supply and scrubs and block lines and Hutamaki in, in terms of some of the PPE gear. Uh, and we're very effective and very successful. And the security of supply issue, I think, is something that increasingly all uh, uh, governments across the world would be looking to because clearly the experience during the pandemic was of the difficulty of accessing that and that critical supply which was needed very quickly by the health services. Uh, so I think we do need to look at that. I think it is doable within whatever arrangements we have uh, with Europe beyond uh, the 1st of January uh, and, and we need to ensure that if local manufacturers are going to repurpose then they are guaranteed or at least have a, a huge degree of certainty in terms of an ongoing uh, contract and ongoing demand for the goods that they might supply. Mr. Paul Fruit. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement here this morning. I can certainly tell that the Minister is hungry, hungry for reform, hopefully. Um, and I also pay tribute to my colleague William Humphrey, Chairperson of the Public Accounts Committee, who has been pushing for some time now for private sector influence in the Procurement Board. Can I ask the Minister? Uh, he states in his statement that the compliance with the guidance had not been entirely consistent in the past. And also, uh, and can he outline to this House what he means by that uh, sentence? And also, he tells us that the procurement guidance notes will now go to the executive for, for approval. How were they approved before? Well, the, the lack of consistency, I think, is reflected in that some policies which the procurement uh, board brought forward and guidance, particularly in relation to social value, were seen as optional add-ons rather than essential. Uh, and what we want to do is, by giving the Board more expertise to develop better policies in, in, in a quicker way by having the key people involved. And that's not to disregard the permanent secretaries, but you almost had a duplication then. If it goes through permanent secretaries and ends up in the executive, uh, then the executive gives it the authority uh, and we ensure that the uh, policies which are, are, are developed and the guidance notes, that previously the guidance notes were approved by the board itself. Uh, and that was the extent of the status they had. This time the, the guidance notes will be approved by the executive and there is then a responsibility on executive ministers to make sure that those guidance notes and on their accounting officers are followed through in terms of their own departments and their arm's length bodies and agencies. Uh, so it gives the, the, the issue of the guidance and the policies which are produced more teeth. Uh, gives them more enforceability uh, and in, ter in terms of that, that gives them more consistency. Uh, because in, you may find that it depends on the attitude of a permanent secretary. Some departments were keen in pursuing and, 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 and promoting these issues, and others perhaps not so much. Uh, so we want to get consistency across the board, uh, and we want to ensure that there, there is that level of expertise within the board itself to get the best policy, possible policies and guidance notes. Mrs. Martina Anderson. Ms. Pri can call you. Uh, Minister, I really welcome uh, your statement because for far too long the social component of the uh, procurement contracts were one that was least enforced. 
and uh, those that are further away from the labour market have found it very difficult, uh, particularly the brokers, to get access. So, Minister, will you ensure that the more robust monitoring and enforcement that you refer to in your statement results in the three billion pound of public money that's spent yearly on this gives training and job opportunities to those in the greatest need in the most deprived areas like Derry City and beyond? Well, yes, and that's the intention. As I say, the social value end of that, and we've brought in the SIB, who have, who have, uh, have been uh, largely responsible for the bi social policy, because, uh, but also in terms of those other issues, employment of apprentices and long term unemployed. Uh, we want to ensure that that uh, consistency travels down through, because when it sometimes gets to contractors, and that's why the involvement of the construction industry, for instance, and the board itself, then gives you that uh, interface where you can see what the issues are from the other side. It's one thing producing policies through civil servants and, and, and uh, public representatives, but another thing, uh, that engagement with the sector that then has to implement that. And, and so uh, it was, we did a useful discussion with people in the Derry area in relation to how some of this has not made its way through onto the ground. Uh, and I think those are the sort of issues that we want to correct in terms of our engagement with the board and ensuring that it is effective, that there is a clear understanding of where the policy becomes unstuck in terms of the practice, and that we fix those things to make sure that the, the outcomes that we desire are actually achieved. Mr Matthew Toul. Uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister a little bit more about the process of procurement policy? specifically guidance notes going back to the executive. Um, it would be fair to say that this year the executive, in terms of its decision making, has not always covered itself in glory in terms of timing, notwithstanding the unique circumstances. Can you assure us that these notes going back to the executive will not either gum up the process of procurement, jeopardise actual real social value aims being included, or allow this to simply be another tool for divvying up um, favours between um, certain parties in the executive? Well, I can't in turn ask the member to explain, but the last point, I think, is something which bears some explanation from himself, that procurement policy would be used for divvying up favours between parties in the executive. I think that's an outrageous statement. Uh, and I would ask the member, perhaps, at some other place to go and justify that. Uh, he's actually accusing people of corruption, uh, of divvying up uh, procurement favours in the executive. The fact is the executive has and his party is a member, uh, his party has a, a, a member on the executive, has had uh, plenty of disagreements over key issues which have, uh, uh, have been well documented. It's also produced a range of agreements on a multitude of issues, uh, and I don't see these issues becoming uh, one of significant contention. There is an agreement, uh, and I've brought the proposal for a reconstitution of the board to the executive without any dissenting uh, uh, voices been raised against it and, and outlined uh, my ambition to have a more effective social value policy, more effective procurement, uh, more effective uh, consistency in terms of the application of policies, and all of that was agreed by the executive. So I don't anticipate uh, any difficulty in that regard. As I say, in relation to the last remark, uh, I, I'm not sure how he would intend to stand that up. I know he's the cover uh, from within this institution uh, for remarks like that, but uh, I, I do think that he's obliged if he's making an insinuation uh, that there's divvying up in terms of procurement among uh, executive parties, then he has an obligation to stack that up uh, or else withdraw it. Point of order, Mr. O'Toole. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I mean, I, I would like to make clear when I talked about divvy divvying up, uh, there was no suggestion that I'm talking about individual uh, procurement, pra like procurement. Um, of individual contracts. I didn't say that, and I think the Minister has read too much into what I said. What I did say was that there is an issue around things going to the executive and, and be, becoming, uh, becoming part of political bartering. That was the point I was making. I think it was fairly clear in my remarks, and I stand by them. Strictly speaking, I don't think that is a point of order, but you have put on the record uh, your intention. I think it is important that members at all times speak to each other with moderation and um, Tolerance, I suppose, is probably as good a word as any. Um, but I understand that people have strong views. Your remarks are now on the record, and your clarification has been given. Uh, Mr. Andrew Muir. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement. I think procurement will play a vital role in terms of the economic recovery, which we will need over the years ahead following COVID-19. Um, one of the uh, key issues the Minister will be aware of is in relation to an infrastructure commission. Proposals have been circulated in relation to that. So I want to ask the Minister if he could provide an update on his views in relation to those proposals and how it would interact with what has been announced today. 
Well, of course, we want to see the most effective use uh, of uh, significant amounts of capital and money uh, for, for infrastructure for a range of reasons. One, that you want to see it spent well, you want to see maximum value in return for that, that you want to see maximum contribution to the local economy as a consequence of that spend. And, and, and of course, construction is a key component of our local economic activity. Uh, and we want to see where it is possible uh, to do that, that it benefits uh, local construction companies. Uh, so I think having the, mm -hmm. the Construction Employers Federation represented on the procurement board uh, and also the, the person responsible within the Department of Infrastructure uh, in policy terms for procurement. I think that brings a, a new level of, uh, uh, of expertise in relation to that, and I hope that would see better outcomes in terms of procurement, which is something I think we all want to achieve. Mr. Marvin Storey. I welcome the statement today, and as a former finance minister, uh, the minister will be well aware I've raised concerns about procurement in the past, and I trust that today is more than just, uh, as we've had previously, a, a name change. We had the famous change from CPD to CPD. That was a real surreal moment in, in the civil service, I have to say. Uh, so I trust that what we will see today is actually progress. And, and I do welcome the fact that uh, the construction industry is now involved. But could I ask the Minister, uh, I notice, and, and uh, I could be wrong on this, but just seek clarification on two things. One, in regards to the involvement of education, declaring interest as a Board of Governor of two schools in my own constituency. The, the procurement processes in education are woeful. Absolutely, we are being done over in terms of that process at a cost to the public purse. And secondly, could he maybe explain to the House the relationship there will be between the board as it will be reconstituted and CPD? Because there are many who are still very sceptical as to whether or not we can get delivery in regards to procurement. Well, I thank the member for his questions, and he has raised these issues to pass. I'm not sure if that dramatic change from CPD to CPD happened under his watch <laughs> or not. Uh, but uh, can I say it, 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 this, there is a clear intention, because this isn't just a, a, a name change in relation to the board. This is a, a change of personnel. It's uh, taken out of the uh, permanent sector. That's not to cast any aspersions in relation to the people who served on the board, and I thank them uh, for the service. It was actually to bring in, as he says, the expertise from the sectors, to have the people in the board from the departmental representatives who are the actual ones dealing with procurement. Uh, I know education is a gap, but it doesn't mean there is no ongoing consultation with departments. And Sharon Smith from the Department of Finance will have a responsibility for engaging with, that, with the other departments who don't happen to be represented uh, on the board. And education, obviously, is a significant spender uh, of public money in terms of, of uh, particularly uh, uh, public contracts. Uh, so uh, there will be that read across. Uh, and the clear intention is for a new start to this. It's a reconstituted board. It's, it's, it's coming from a different place, if you like, in terms of that, that involvement in it. Uh, and we want to see then those people who are representing the industry side of it, the construction or uh, the SMEs, that they are actually engaging with their own sectors. So they're bringing forward the views of that sector. There's an intention to create a, a facility there that people can actually come and privately give information in terms of any complaints they might have, because previously people would have felt uh, if they were complaining about the main contractor, uh, and it was a genuine and legitimate complaint that you know, to say so publicly might have been detrimental to their ability to do future work. Uh, so we want to create a facility whereby people do have a, an opportunity to actually register issues uh, with the board in a way which protects themselves in terms of, of, of any blowback, if, if that were to be the case, in terms of relationships within contracts. So it is genuinely an attempt to do things differently, uh, and obviously we have to test that as we go along, but I hope that you know, in not too distant future the member will recognise that there's a different way of doing these things. Mr Storey. Just for a point of clarity, it seems as though members are wanting to clarify things that they've said. Could I just clarify, it didn't happen under my watch in terms of the name change. However, it did happen under suspension of this House, and I think, therefore, the Finance Minister maybe and his party takes responsibility for it. I don't think I need to rule on that. Um, <laughs> Mr O'Dowd. Clarify if points of order are actually allowed during a ministerial <laughs> statement and question time, because I believe they're not. Uh, I think, actually, that is a point of order. That is a point of order, and therefore that is unique this morning in being an actual legitimate point of order, and the member is, of course, correct. Mr. Malisha McHugh. 
I must I'd like to thank you for your statement uh, as well. It is a good opportunity this for change, uh, and in particular, uh, and being a wee bit more specific about it, uh, Minister, in order to ensure social value is incorporated into uh, procurement contracts, will the board consider a minimum score for social value alongside price and quality? Yes, I think that would be an effective way of achieving that, uh, because if, if the focus is just on price and quality, then that ability to, uh, to, to give proper consideration to social value. Social value isn't just uh, it's a, many things. It can be about a more green approach to construction, uh, as well as you know, having social outcomes in terms of employment of people or ensuring that there is spend in certain areas uh, and that there is access for people from the community and social enterprises who can provide services as well. So there are a whole range of measures, but yes, scoring contracts uh, and doing so in its way which guarantees that social value is a component part of that is an effective way of doing that. Mr John O'Dowd. Thank you, Last uh, Kroya. Just to ask that the Minister, and um, perhaps the issue of gigs now being approved by the executive will lessen the litigation against contracts at times. Given the, the, the scale of, of contracts awarded at a time, it is unsurprising that there is uh, JRs, etc. brought, but we have to lessen those. Will the Minister ensure that the Procurement Board looks at how we minimise legal action taken? And also, the, the Economy Committee several weeks ago received a presentation from the Law Society around mediation in such matters. Will he also ask the Procurement Board to look at that process as well? Yes, I, I, I sort of referenced that in the response to Mr. Story. That uh, I think, you know, when you get to litigation, it's it's really at an end point of where a contract's awarded and somebody's dissatisfied with how it's been done, and it does have the impact of holding up uh, capital projects in particular, and can have a very significant and, and detrimental impact on economic activity generally. Uh, that's not to say people are entitled to go to court if they feel very strongly that they have a case to make, and, and you would not deny people that. But I think there is an opportunity at an earlier stage to to have some kind of a mitigation uh, process, and that's why the, uh, I would be asking the board to consider an alternative service for suppliers to be able to reach, con raise concerns, uh, and to do so in, in some instances in a, in a private capacity or in a, 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 a private opportunity for people, because uh, there are business relationships at the heart of procurement, uh, and people often are reluctant to speak out in case some of those business relationships are, are damaged as a consequence of that. So I think we, we want a, an alternative measure for for uh, suppliers to be able to raise concerns confidentially and for the matter to be independently reviewed. So I think that will be a key part of it. And hopefully that will have the effect of offsetting the, the possibility of people going to court, because I think that does, uh, while people are entitled to do that, it undoubtedly holds up processes and, and causes an a, a impact on budgetary spending. Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, uh, for your answers so far. Minister, in your statement, uh, you said compliance with guidance has not been entirely consistent. And my question then will be, how will this be measured in this new procurement board? How will you measure success? Thank you. Well, I think, I think you would measure it in the consistent application of policy and guidance notes. Uh, and, and I think what we have found in the past is that that sometimes hasn't filtered down through departments. Uh, and I think uh, the approval of guidance notes by the executive, the approval of procurement policy by the executive, then gives that a strength that it previously didn't have. Uh, and there is an obligation then on executive ministers and accounting officers in departments to follow through uh, in relation to that. There also will be a monitoring of that uh, by the board to make sure that where compliance isn't happening. And we will have representatives of the sector, as, as, as we have outlined. So if they find that you know, these policies are not coming through uh, the bottom end and it's not, been, uh, it's not the practical experience of people applying for contracts and engaging in provision of services, then we will quickly hear about that. And, and I think there is a responsibility on the board to challenge uh, where we need to challenge. Mr Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Principal uh, Deputy Speaker. I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around the fact Mr O'Dowd uses a point of order to make clear that points of order are out of order at this time. Um, I thank the Minister for his statement. I particularly welcome uh, the appointment of Colin Jess uh, to represent the social enterprise uh, sector. Also very reassuring that the Minister of Finance, uh, his grasp of mathematics is sound enough to be able to identify how many questions the committee chair squeezed into his, his remarks. Uh, in, in your remarks, Minister, um, you, 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 you talked about social value and included the private sector, so I wonder if you could expand on your definition 
of social value and whether you would intend uh, to legislate so that goes into a social value act. Well, uh, can I thank him for his, his question. He got a few squeezed in there himself. Uh, <laughs> I have to say, uh, Mr O'Dowd's uh, contribution isn't the most surreal thing that has ever happened in this chamber, by my experience, by a long shot. <laughs> uh, but can I, can I say in relation to that, yes, social value includes a whole range of things, a greener approach to doing business, uh, you know, paying of, of minimum wages, uh, uh, and I think there are many private sector uh, companies who do wish to in engage in that. And if, if that was a, a, a part of uh, uh, the scoring in terms of award and contract, that there are, I think there are many in the private sector would embrace that. It wouldn't be seen as a burden for them. Uh, I'm sure he, he has the same experience to speak to very many people who, who want to deliver better outcomes for society as well as obviously to uh, secure contracts and improve their own businesses uh, as well as that. So the question of legislation, clearly any social uh, value policy I think it's much stronger if it's underpinned by legislation. We have, uh, because procurement side of, of the department have been involved so much in assisting other departments over the COVID period in terms of, of getting supplies, that I'm not certain whether in the time left in this mandate we, we will have the time to do legislation, but we have asked officials to explore that. And if there is an opportunity to do social value legislation within the time frame left, then I would be very happy to do it. Ms Gemma Dolan. Minister, thank you for your statement. Um, many school principals ask for more flexibility for minor procurements. Is this something the Procurement Board will consider? Yes, I think, yes, uh, I think we need to get that balance right. And uh, as I, I think it was in response to question time last week, I was saying that, that many of elected representatives will be given examples of where things are procured at a local level for significantly higher prices than they can be got locally. Uh, and I think there is a balance between ensuring there's transparency and accountability in terms of buying arrangements, because it is public money that's being spent, but also making sure there's a flexibility at a local level to get uh, supplies uh, for the, the best price that they can locally and also uh, contributing to the local economy as well. So uh, the Procurement Board will be undertaking to strike that balance in the right place. Mr Stuart Dixon. Minister, I very warmly welcome your statement today uh, and also indeed your reference to the all-party group on social enterprise, which has been uh, lobbying for a lot of what you're proposing to do today for some eight years now. But just following on from Mr <coughs> Nesbitt's question, you already have a quote on the shelf piece of legislation ready to run to deliver a social value act for Northern Ireland. We would in many ways be playing catch up with the other four nations of the United Kingdom and indeed the Republic of Ireland where social value legislation is well embedded. It is slightly disappointing to hear that that may not be able to be achieved within the lifetime of this mandate. So can I ask you, Minister, in respect of your statement, social value will be a mandatory component of the procurement exercise. How will that actually work uh, here in Northern Ireland? Well, I think if, if it becomes, firstly, if I can do the legislation within this mandate, I will. Uh, I can give them that assurance, uh, and I want to make sure uh, that, that, that we do have sufficient time to do that. Uh, you, you know if, if we start a legislative process and it doesn't conclude, it, it falls off the shelf uh, at the end of the mandate. We have to start all, all over again in a new mandate, who, whoever might be in the, the post. Uh, but I would like to do that. Uh, it's always been my intention to do that from when I came into the department. But other priorities in terms of responding to the pandemic uh, took, took over. Uh, in my view, if, if the policies and the, the guidance notes that the Procurement Board sent to the Executive are approved, then they have executive approval as a policy which is obliged then in terms of the, each department, the permanent secretaries, uh, the, the staff within those departments to follow through on, on the arms and bodies and the agencies as well. Uh, and so, as I say, because we have now people in from the various sectors on the Procurement Board, they can see if that is filtering right down through to where it's supposed to actually take action on the ground, where it's supposed to achieve an outcome on the ground. Uh, and we want to hear from uh, people like the, the social enterprise sector, but all of the other sectors as well, uh, uh, and, and to ensure then that those policies are actually followed through. But if there is an opportunity, and, and I would like the opportunity to do legislation, I certainly will. Mrs Dolores Kelly. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement. Minister, you will be aware that quite often we have international contractors winning some of the biggest contracts, and then they subcontract and subcontract until actually most of the money is sliced off in terms of management rather than the product at the end of the day. I just wonder how you can, um, if you like, legislate uh, for, uh, to prevent such uh, occurrences in the future. Well, I mean, there, it, 
What you tend to find is that the size of the contract attracts more international attention, uh, and so contracts can be framed in such a way as to, to be broken up into various sectors, which perhaps uh, makes them more uh, within the range of local uh, employers. But of course, you have to do that within our local companies. You have to do that within a way which is correct within guidelines and, and rules. Uh, and we still aren't sure in terms of what the hangover from uh, the exit from Europe will be in terms of state aid and all of those, those rules. So, but I think even within those, there, there are uh, ways of doing procurement which can, as best as possible, uh, support uh, local companies. Local companies actually get about f four out of every five contracts, as it currently stands, but of course it's the, the quality of those contracts and the size of those contracts that, that, that needs to be measured. Uh, and so where that can be achieved, I think it is obviously a desirable outcome. It has to be done within regulations, but uh, I, I do think we need to do procurement in a way uh, which does provide the maximum support we can to the local economy. Ms. Rachel Woods. Deputy Speaker and the Minister for his statement and just on Mr Egan's comment on an independent chairman, an independent chairwoman certainly would be good too. Um, the Minister will be aware that we have an opportunity to build back better from COVID but also to tackle our climate emergency through a just transition. So I'd like to ask the Minister what consideration will there be to a green sustainable procurement by this board? Can it be mandatory? What role will there be for cooperative models in procurement, focusing on community wealth building and working with councils? And perhaps I can also ask what he means by the living wage on page five. Well, uh, the, uh, firstly, yes, uh, I think the, the uh, executive has targets in terms of, of uh, green outcomes, carbon emission reduction. Uh, and I would see, like to see those reflected and should be reflected in terms of our procurement policy because the executive can't just argue for these things and then spend £3 billion and not try and use that to affect the outcome of its own policies. So I think it's going to be a key component uh, in relation to procurement as well. Uh, the, 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 there is a, 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 and I'm trying to remember the, the title of it, the, the Living Wage uh, Foundation have, have outlined the definition of living wage and that's the definition that I worked on. Mr Tim Allister. I'm going to bring the Minister back to the point that Ms Dolan raised about a, the lower end of the procurement market uh, and the example of schools. Hitherto, school had a broken window, bring in a local handyman, fixed for very little. Today, I have to report it to Armagh or wherever, someone comes out, looks at it, someone goes back, someone comes out, and the cost is phenomenal. And so, would the Minister consider? bringing to the table of the board a proposition that there should be an exemption threshold below which local uh, service needs can be met by the local management in the way that formerly it was done. Well, uh, can I say, I, I, I mean, I accept all of us in here. It's, it's interesting that the conversation with people in procurement they, they wouldn't have hear, heard the stories that we all hear as elected reps from school principals who say, I could get a local guy to come and fix this or a local woman to come and fix this, and uh, this would cost a tenth of the price that I'm, I have to go through. So, yes, I think a local uh, threshold is, I think there is a threshold, but I think we need to uh, examine that to see if it's sufficient uh, in terms of its application. Because uh, clearly there, are, there is the balance, as I said to, uh, to Gemma Dolan, there is the balance between transparency, accountability, and people not given their brothers-in-laws or their cousins' contracts from, from schools or any other uh, public uh, sector uh, procurement operation, uh, and also making sure we have procurement is about value for money. It's one of the primary functions about ensuring uh, public spend gets value for money. So we're clearly the practice at a local level don't give value for money. I think we have to look at that, uh, but also to make sure that you do have that transparency and accountability uh, built in as well. Mr. Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister has just mentioned the issue of value for money, but would he uh, ensure that when the Procurement Board meets, that it recognises that big is not always beautiful and that sometimes it limits competition and results in significant subcontracting where actually the control is lost? And for example, painting a classroom can be two or three times the cost of getting a local painter. Well, I think it, 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 uh, it speaks to the previous conversations we've been having in relation to all that. And I think it is a balance between ensuring that you get transparency and accountability, but you get uh, value for money at a local level and small, uh, small contracts. And, and as I said, four out of five 
contracts are won locally, uh, but it just obviously depends on the value of those. And we, that's why I think there are the, the value of having people in from the various sectors, because you have people who are actually the practitioners of how this works. Uh, and can say, you know, it's one thing having a policy and having a very good policy, which we can all support, but it's another thing seeing how the experience of that actually impacts on the ground and how it works in practice rather than on theory in the paper that it's developed on. So I think that will be the value of having those various sectors, and they in turn representing the voice uh, of the industries that they come from and the sectors that they come from as well. So we, and also that function that we have from hearing confidentially from people in, in, in the out there in the. the in the, the world where, where people procure these contracts and, and, and enact these contracts. So I think that will all be valuable, but uh, again, in terms of local spend, it, it is about getting the balance on the threshold right in relation to that. No other member is rising in their place or indicating to me. Um, so that concludes questions on this statement. Before I move on to the next item, I have been, um, during question time, reviewing my copy of standing orders. And standing order 19 relates to questions. Two